All right, I think we are live. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this special webcast today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Catherine. I'm the communications manager over at NaNoWriMo. Aw, yay, heart's back. And uh, we're here today as part of our um, nano prep. Uh, series. So um, if you've never done NaNoWriMo before, or if you've done it before, um, if you're just getting super pumped up and excited for next month, somehow it's already next month. I know, um, right? How does that happen? <laughs> so right? close. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we have, we have a bunch of uh, resources for getting ready to prepare your novel. And this week we're focusing, we're focusing on world building. Um, so I am super excited to have um, some of our sponsors from World Anvil here to talk to you today about world building. Um, so I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, we're really excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us, Catherine. Very much so, actually. Yeah, we have been waiting for this for a long time now. Yeah. I wanted to actually come here and talk to the people from Nano because we love Nano for like, we were sponsoring for second, third year now. Yeah, I think so. Third yeah. year now, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, we really love it. We love what you guys yeah. do. We think it's so cool. Um, just like your community is so awesome and your spirit of, in, of engagement and, and the way that you run things. It's just so beautiful. So shout out to people who are in our community who've dropped in. Hello, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you haven't met us yet, hi, we're Janet and Demetrius. Um, that's Demetrius, that's Janet. That's, yeah, I, I don't have a beard. That's how you can tell. <laughs> um, so we are... Um, we, you'll be seeing a lot of cats today, so apologies for that. Um, we are the uh, co-founders of World Anvil. Yes. I don't know why that was a question. We are the co-founders of World Anvil. We made World Anvil. It's almost four years old. Um, and it's something that Demetrius made for me to help me with my world building and with my novel writing. Because essentially, I know how to world build but I did not have anything to keep the world building organized, to keep it searchable and referenceable. I had basically that Google document. You know the one? The one that's like 100 pages long and it yep. crashes when you open it. The one where like you have a section called religion and then another section called culture. And because they're so interconnected, you end up like accidentally deviating and then suddenly your core document does not make any sense anymore because everything is in the wrong. Oh my God. So that's I what that's, I was using. I think that's how we started that. We started because at some point, Janet was, it came to me and said, Dimitris, my Google document is crashing. I can no longer access what I have been doing. And it's like, oh my God, no. So we found a way to save it. But I was like, that's not the way for you to work. There's no way you can find things. And then as I was scanning through the document to realize what is it that Janet needs in order for her to go build for her novel, I realized that, you know, Jonathan, you have this written three different times in three different locations with different information every time. And I was like, yeah. you know what? I can it's fix that. Crazy. But so that's what I do in my day life. So I decided to build World Anvil for Janet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really where World Anvil came from. And that's the core use. It's organizing your world building. It's not just to uh, inspire you, although it will inspire you. Um, but it's really to keep everything organized and make everything completely searchable. And that that's really like the core of what we do, essentially. Yeah. Um, so everything is organized in articles. There are interactive maps. There are family trees. There are diplomacy trees where you can like map which organization. Yeah, the cat is just loving the hand waving. Map which organization feels what about which other organization. So if you're doing like... I don't know if you're doing magic schools and the way that they interact or if you're doing countries and diplomacy stuff, um, anything with intrigue, that's obviously super useful. Um, and then, of course, we have timelines, uh, because what is world building without world building history and what is keeping history organized, if not timelines? Um, and we're just about to have a new uh, time feature that comes out as well. That's a secret, that's a secret. Um, but essentially all of this goes together. Not every author is going to need every single one of those things, but all of these tools are just designed to keep your world as organized as you can as, and, and showcase it the way that you want to, to yourself, so that you can really visualize it and to other people exactly. if you, if you want, want to share. To, of course. So a lot of our authors use it for marketing or they use it to share with beta readers uh, or they use it for book launches. But plenty of our authors just use it in private because it's a really good way to keep track of stuff. Uh, and that is basically, in a nutshell, that's what World Anvil is and that's what it does. You go in, you put your world building in there and it keeps track of it. And if you want a novel writing software, there is also a novel writing software in there. 
So you can reference your series Bible as you write your novel uh, in the same window without having context shift because context shift, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this, but swapping between windows is the quickest way to forget what you were doing in the world. Like you go from one tab to another and you're suddenly, suddenly you're in a Wikipedia dive reading about frog toes and you have no idea how you got there. So that was, that was the reason we added the novel writing software. Cause we were like, okay, we have this killer series Bible. It's got all of your stuff in order. How do we get that next step? How do we stop that, um, massive problem that context shift yeah um so yeah now we have a novel writing software as well and it all integrates together and um you can publish digitally on world anvil or you can export and publish as you want to basically yes oh that's everything ah. it's not that's, everything but it's, it's not everything but let's, it's, let's not take the whole in a nutshell yes. that is world anvil and that is what it does and why it does it as Kaya San says in the chat, yes, you can choose what you need. Absolutely. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't need all of that. I just need a serious Bible and novel writing software. That's fine. If you're sitting there thinking, I need family trees of my family trees. That's fine. You could do that too. And there, there is a link to World Anvil in the video description. So if anybody wants to check it out um, throughout the webcast, um, you, can, you can go and click on that link there. Um, I have somebody in the chat, Marissa says, oh my God, my world building info for my main, for my main writing project is just in my head. So it sounds- I envy you. Yeah. I cannot even remember what I ate for breakfast today. Actually, it was, um, I think it was Awesome Scott Card, um, who I have mixed feelings about personally, but you know, is, is a very interesting person when he talks about writing, who said at one point he had to send paper mail to his fans to ask them the color of the eyes of one of the characters because he could not remember and did not want to go through all of his books to find out that information. Yes. Wow. That's, that's what happens when you don't write down your world building. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. Well, I was, so you've, you've mentioned a few elements of world building um, so far, but just for people who are new to it, or this sounds a little bit overwhelming, um, I was wondering if you could, if you have like a working definition of world building, like what, what does it actually mean to world building? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that I will start by saying world building is a very personal thing because the way that we see the world clearly is reflected on the way we create worlds, okay? That's 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 fine for sure. But having said that, world building is the practice of creating an imaginary world, either that's for a setting of any sort, like anything from fantasy to science fiction to anything else you want, and combining all the details of that world into a single document that will allow you to write your novel or to actually uh, create a world for your own, like, how you call it? Uh, your own novel or, or, or IP or whatever that yeah. is, narrative universe. Or just for, because it's cool. Because or just because, yes. right, exactly. I would go further than that. I would say that world building is all of the people, places, and things that we imagine that do not exist. So you can have real world world building. For example, Jane Austen invents all of these places that do not exist in the real world, right? Mm -hmm. She writes about Pemberley, which is this uh, magnificent manor house that Darcy lives in. Uh, Pemberley is not a real place. It does not exist. I'm sure it was based on real places, but at a basic level, that is world building. Absolutely. I mean, Again, it has to do with the definition of what Absolutely. you consider and what you're writing. Because if you're writing, for example, historical fiction, you can even say that, you know what, ascribing characteristics to people who are long dead and you've never met, it is world building in many ways. Yeah. Or, for example, defining the location of a specific house or manor house and ex expanding on it yeah. is also world building. But in general speaking, when we talk about the fantasy setting and the fantasy, which is the most commonly used, about 85% of our worlds, in fact, are fantasy and about 12% of them are uh, science fiction. The rest is actually everything else. Uh, we're talking about the practice of creating a document yeah. that in most cases includes articles, maps, and timelines of events, locations, and people, places, items, characters, uh, conflicts, and everything else you can imagine a world, exists in the world and you would like to write about effectively. Yeah, I think the, um, the, the most reassuring thing about world building is that everybody in the chat who is a writer, who has written anything, is already doing it. And that's yes. that's a really important thing to remember. Like, it's not some scary high fl floating castle somewhere. It doesn't mean painting all your animals blue so they feel original. You are already world building. And when you dive into it, you can remember that. So A, it's not scary. 
and B, you're just doubling down on the choices that you're making. Essentially, why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? Should I be dialing this up to 11? Is this necessary for my setting? These are the kinds of questions that you can ask once you realize that you are, in fact, world building in the first place. <laughs> I think another way that people talk about this, in fact, to call world building a professional um, a, a, a professional way of approaching escapism. Oh, yeah, I like that. It's a very good way of saying, you know what, if you don't or you don't like this world, there is another world and you can make it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason we saw a surge of people writing novels and, and world building during the pandemic. And it's it's largely because the world was kind of horrible and we just wanted to live in our own. Yes. I know, right? That's great. Um, we had somebody in the chat asking about accessibility features on World Anvil. So I don't know if you have um, an option. So that, but... uh, World Anvil uh, is written with accessibility in mind, but we also work with UserWay, which is an amazing company that was built about two years ago. The guys started it and created a foundation for it and we're working very close with them to actually make it even more accessible and help them build their tool as well to make other websites accessible. Yeah. For In the case of World Danville, uh, user way gives accessibility in terms of low um, uh, visibility or issues with uh, sight. As you can see, I have only one eye. I kind of like, yeah. really like it. Accessibility is something that's really important yes. to us. Um, uh, but also it has readers and it's actually built to be read by readers if you are blind. Screen readers. Screen yeah. readers, of course. Yes, exactly. So accessibility is very strong in World Danville. It's not perfect, but nothing is perfect when it comes to accessibility. We're trying to make it as better as we can continuously. And our community is helping us to do it better. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we know that a lot of people... Uh, just people that we know in our community who are partially sighted or who are blind are using the platform and are not having problems with it. But as always, like if you spot something, let us know. We're literally, we literally the people who make it. We can make it better, and we want to. We just need that feedback. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And uh, yeah, this is just a reminder for people who are watching. If you have questions as we're going through this, I'm going to be asking some questions because. I am fascinated about world building and want to learn more. Um, but if you guys have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll be monitoring it throughout the webcast. Um, and there will definitely be space at the end, but we'll ask them as they as they come up too. So absolutely. absolutely. Uh, cool. So I, I I love I love how you talked about world building world building is not being scary because <laughs> I think it can feel really intimidating. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of go into some details about like when and how world building happens while you're writing a story, like kind of yeah. what does it look Absolutely. like? Absolutely. I actually see a message from Red Hood in chat that says, as wonderful as world building is, and I get it, I'm constantly getting lost in it, you're doing it in the service of a novel, make sure you eventually do the actual novel writing. Absolutely correct. You have 100% of my support. One of the first things we actually discuss in our own way of wall building, which is called agile wall building, and one of the primary things we discuss when we talk about it's this. built into the world, exactly. into World Anvil as well. World Anvil as well is actually world building does not have to be prose writing. And that's actually a mistake that a lot of writers do. And we keep like telling them that they should not be doing that. World building is about keeping organized notes, not about extending your novel writing into the actual lore of your world. You, as Janet says, for example, the good example here is the Elven Shoes conundrum. <laughs> so effectively, if you want to write about Elven Shoes, just write the things that you need. You need to know, for example, that they are red, they have that shape, and that actually can be bought or created by that material. You don't have to write a five pages thesis on Elven Shoes in order to have world build about Elven Shoes. Yes. Then you got world builder's disease, which exactly. we can talk more about later if you want to know more about world builder's disease, because it's a problem and people experience it. I'm in this picture and I don't like it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely something that we we built World Anvil with uh, in, mind. in mind for because you know many of the people using World Anvil, it's not just novelists, it's also gamers, it's gaming studios. There's a lot of people world building on World Anvil, but most of them, I say most, some of them are pure world builders, but most of them are world building because they want to make a thing. And the thing should not be sacrificed be just because world building is super cool, which it is, and we all know it. But um, yeah, so what we recommend essentially is um, we recommend starting your world building after you get that, fl that flash, whatever it is, that, oh my God, this would be so cool. Or, oh my God, I want to make a steampunk world. Or, oh my gosh, I was driving home through this mist and now I've just got the idea for Mistborn, right? That's Brandon Sanderson's story. Um, wherever this inspiration comes from, 
when you start with what we call the meta section, and it is literally a section on World Anvil full of questions to help you get the basis of your setting, the first question is motivation. Why are you building this thing? So motivation forward is something that is so critical from the beginning to understand what the setting is for. If the setting is for novels, you need to make sure that there are actual characters there. This sounds funny, but we have a world on World Anvil that's all fish. There are no main characters in this world. It is not a good writing world. It's a beautiful collection of fish in it's an amazing incredible. alien ocean, yeah. but it's fish. Yeah, it's a fish world. So do not make a fish world unless the fish are sapient if you need main characters, right? Or if you're a fisherman with a lot of focus on fish, I guess. <laughs> it sounds like 20,000 leagues under the sea. The end of right, yeah, exactly. With a focus on fish. <laughs> <laughs> my glasses off <laughs> so yeah um that's that's one of the things that we ask people we suggest that people start with first so there's no like rank and file you must do this you must do that you must do the other in world anvil but we do have a suggested path and that begins with a meta um so that means uh thinking about things like what are you writing for if you want to write a fantasy novel then that helps you with the next question what genre are you going for or genres right all of these questions lead you towards the beginning of your setting. So genre and tone and reader experience and character experience. If you look at something like Game of Thrones, um, you know that the character experience is pretty grim. And that's a really, really important part of the world building. There's a reason why there are like crows and ravens everywhere. It's because they're super sinister and they make the world feel really great. Yeah. These are the kind of things we discussed in Meta, as Janet said. For example, creating these little moments that connect everything together, which people don't think about when they're writing their novels, but if they are inherently a part of world building, that you probably should be doing before you write your novel. And it's literally a maximum of one page if you put them all together. Yeah, but th for example, what kind of things you can use to reinforce the theme? Like every single big um, uh, thing that you've seen, like you have been written, even if it was a series or if it was a single book, they have these little nuggets that you see again and again. For example, a very common one you see in fantasy from Tolkien's time is that elves do not go well with dwarves. And that was something he used so many times around. And not only he used it as a, as a point of reference for the history, he used it also in the arguments, for example, between Legolas and every single dwarf he ever found, but also he used it as a in a way to make them friends. So this was one of the themes. Elves and dwarves don't go well, for example, yeah. or a good triumphs over evil kind of thing for, for his, because it was like a, a kind of like a dark but noble world. Effectively, you know, our heroes can go against all odds to save the world, but the world, but the is, world is pretty dark. dark and horrible. Exactly. Yeah. So these are the kind of things you establish when you're writing your meta. And these are the things that every time that you're stuck or you don't know what to do or what the answer is to the question, you can head back to it and say like, ah, yeah, okay, I know what I'm doing there because I know how they will react. Like if you're looking for, okay, do they have, should my play, my character have the um, agency to make a change? Yes or no? Or you can say, for example, if your meta says, you know what, this is a very grim world, which actually means less agency for your characters, this might be possibly that, yes, they might be able to try to do that, but at the end they will fail. Like, or, for example... Or that they should fail a lot of times along the way, before. and their success might be a Pyrrhic victory, or it might be a partial success. Or, or have a, a big not, sacrifice, yeah, for example. exactly. If not Pyrrhic, way. then a success at great cost, right? And this is the kind of stuff that you're building into your world, so that your stories feel like they're really a part of that world, they're very immersive, and they feel true to the world. There's nothing worse than, than you know, a uh, a novel and I've read a few where the world is dark and horrible and everything is dark and horrible and the whole thing is a slog first and it gets to the end and suddenly it's this like bright rainbow shining elf land there's a complete genre whiplash and you go what is this book that I've suddenly become what was I reading before and what am I reading now? suddenly unicorns essentially, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um, and, and I think that goes very well to the idea of focus as well we talk about in meta which has to do with in fact that not every book can actually talk about everything. If you try to write a book about fantasy and you try to, uh, to talk about, for example, LGBTQ rights and um, war and social change and the rules of law and religion, at some point you are spreading so thin the focus of your, re of your writing and of your actually, uh, the whole of your writing that this becomes something that nobody can actually adhere to or focus on or believe in and continue reading. So one of the things we are saying, for example, is that you have to find possibly maximum of three to five focus points 
that your story and your world will be more consistent on, while the rest, for example, might be changed, might be actually less important. And that you also should be considering the idea that if the things are on the rise or another fall, like for example, a world that a military conflict is at the rise means that you are either in the middle of a war or you are actually there is a war brewing, like for example, Lord of the Rings. A world that has, for example, the religious is influenced religiously. You have to talk about, in fact, religion, which actually means about morality, and it talks about, in fact, deities, uh, deities and exactly. Organizations so, and so establishing those things in Italy, all you need to do is say, you know what, the focus points of my world is one, two, three, four, five, and this is how I'm focusing it, and that's essentially a, a single paragraph. Yeah. So um, there's a lot of people who talk about world building who talk about this. Brandon Sanderson talks about this. Trent Hergenrader, who is a professor of world building, also talks about this. Um, where, and writes about it. And book. writes about it in his book as well. Um, and obviously our business is world building. So we do a huge amount of research as, as we're sort of creating World Anvil to make sure that it's, it's doing exactly what it should. Um, and yeah, essentially by digging deep into a few points, a, you create a really solid structure for your world. It's just like a building, right? If it's got a good foundation, it's going to stand up pretty well, even with three to five pinions. But also you create the illusion that your world is very, very deep without having to create literally everything. It is an illusion. You're yes. creating an illusion there. There's something Neil Gaiman says, which is uh, he talks about the smudges in the background. And those smudges in the background are so much more credible when you have those pinions that dig deep into your world and that make sense together. Then those smudges in the background are something that you're, you can fill in later in books two to five which or is, that your readers will fill in for themselves. Which is actually very, uh, very nicely goes into the next point, which is the drama points. Yeah. So a world in theory should have about three to a maximum of five drama points. And silly, five major things that are based on the uh, focus points we just discussed that are currently happening. Okay? Current affairs, basically. Current, uh, yeah, the, fi the five major current affairs. Of course, your story will be probably about one of them or related to one of them, but all the others four, which again, you just wrote uh, a paragraph about them in your uh, meta, will be the things that you can actually use as smudges. Like, for example, you know what? Your story might be about Second World War and people in the front lines, for example, fighting for their lives. Okay, And that's actually, of course, the main drama point. There is a world war and this is a part of it. But, for example, if you write about the fact that there is a flu spreading, Spanish flu, you don't really talk about it, but there might be something on a discussion. There might be something they see in the, on the newspaper. You might see secondary example. or tertiary impact. That's exactly. the other thing. So yeah. you see from the major plot, plot, plot sorry, from the major plot line. drama, the plot yeah. line, mm -hmm. that is not necessarily involved in your book, but is making your world feel big and active, there might be a secondary or tertiary trickle down. So for example, they might have trouble getting medical supplies because the medical supplies are all where the big focus of the, of the Spanish flu is happening. So they can't even get like gauze and clean bandages because everything is somewhere else. The other um, way gonna... These are the kinds of ways that you can make your players. And this is something that we talk about when we talk about- My players, you mean? Sorry, your your yeah. your main characters. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, in fact, it it is uh, exactly the same for both. It's the yes. way to stop your main characters feeling like the center of the universe. Yeah, Mary Sue's. The Mary Sue, yeah. exactly. It stops them feeling like Mary Sue's. It means that it feels like they're part of this wider interconnected world where something that's happening over there does have an impact of what's going on over here, which is what you're trying to do. You're trying to create that illusion. Yeah. And so that's a great way to do that. And for example, you can also use drama uh, drama points away, like away from the main story to talk about secondary characters. Like if you have somebody who is back in England and she's a woman working on a factory, like again, for example, it might be like the beginning of the suffragette movement before they even actually happen. Yeah. This is a secondary character which probably probably related with your characters, not taking a main point, but you're still again touching there because your next novel will be about it. So you don't have to talk about it but it still exists in the world. Yeah, absolutely. So all of this stuff that we've just been talking about, and you can tell how passionate we are about world building and how, yeah. how into world building we are. Like, this is not just our, our company. This is our lifetime. And we're both professional writers. So we're both using this kind of stuff all the time. Um, but essentially, this is all the stuff that's in the meta section um, in World Anvil that will help you get your world started um, and help you take that little flash of inspiration that you had and spin it out into something that is exactly what you want because of your motivation and is gonna serve exactly what you need. Um, 
there's a section that helps you figure out the, the physical properties of your world. Is it an ice world like Hoth? Is it a world like Game of Thrones where the seasons are really irregular? There's a space to sort of pin that out. And again, whatever your genre is, whatever your tone is, that's going to enforce them, right? If you want your world to feel really, really dark, you can literally make the night super long. That is a great way to reinforce your genre. It sounds simplistic, but if the night is really long, that suddenly makes life super hard. Or remove the moon. Or remove the moon. That would also cause <laughs> significant <laughs> chaos. Um, and then there's a space to sketch out your people. So who used to be there and what's their story? Who's there now? And what do they need from each other? Because that's where all the yummy conflict comes from. That's where the relationships happen and what actually like what pushes the world in the big scheme of things, yeah. like the, the great stage, of course. Yeah, exactly. And then essentially, once you have this meta created, we also, there's an inspiration space, which we also recommend people fill out. It's so useful to go back to. Um, and particularly when you're trying to refocus on a project. Yeah, like the movies just, you like, the TV series you like, images you like, yeah, music the stuff that you like to be inspired. Yeah, kind. exactly. Like, for example, for my world, I have created literally a playlist on Spotify that I listen to when consistently you're writing, yeah. when I'm writing because it puts me in a specific mood, which in turn actually translates into what I'm writing about my world. Yeah, okay. Exactly. So um, all of that stuff is there. And then essentially for the next step, what we say is look at the people and look at the world so that's the, the scene place where you talk about the physical properties of the world. That might be magic as well. And the people place where you talk about who used to live there and who lives there now. Choose one thing and start writing a world building article. So crack open one of the world building templates and just start writing. And then we'll start generating other things that are related. And those things that are related are, are important because they're crucial to your main concept. And if it's in, if it's in the meta, it's important enough, but it's a main concept yeah. in your world. And so by writing a few articles and then the spin-off articles that come from them. So for example, you're writing about um, a settlement that was important enough to go into your meta. So you need to write about the wider area. You might need to write about the person who founded the settlement. You might need to write about the culture of the settlement. These are all critical things that might actually turn up in your book. They, they need to be there, even if they're just in note form, which is what we recommend. Yeah. Um, and by the time you've done that, you actually have a serious chunk of world building done. Like you have your active world area has started to be fleshed out and you have the beginnings of a series. Bible. Honestly, on the, on the, on the topic of NaNoWriMo, this is exactly what you should be doing probably in October. Like now. Yeah. Right now, because by writing these essentially... Literally about a thousand, two thousand words, which is not a lot. That's not, not for not, not for, for not for Rhymo writers. Not for Rhymo right. writers, exactly. You have everything you need to start writing your novel. Yeah. One of your questions that you asked us is when you should be writing, and like you should be world building. And the answer is kind of weird because if it goes nano, if it goes not nano Rhymo, I would tell you that the answer is always write while you write. Yeah. So you build your um, uh, world building. Uh, archive while you're writing by keeping very simple, very clear, and very uh, non-prosaic notes while you're writing. Non-prose notes, yeah. yes. But for NaNoWriMo, I would say write your NaNoWriMo, right. use use your month, unless you're doing some sort of a rebel, rebel goal. goal, Yes, which I do, for example, this year. But um, apart from when you finish doing it, come to Gold Danville and start feeling by reading your novel and doing it actually post because yeah. that will help you on your first and your second, like that would be the first draft I'm guessing of your novel. So it will help you a lot when you, because you will have a more concise way of actually referencing back to the things you need to change and you need to actually evolve. Like, for example, when you're writing an Rimo, I have seen so many times Janet as well because she has done it to write and then she will figure out, if, of course, that there are some, time things that are not exactly correct like this day lasts for about five years okay, yeah. not not so much but no 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 but there'll be yes. there'll be things like this day is suspiciously long or that time period was suspiciously short okay. how did they get an army together in that time period who knows but reading through your novel and writing down the the, the notes as and, and creating the timeline as you write it you you make it so much easier to on draft to, to, draft to. to fix it essentially yeah absolutely is... i think when i finished my novel one of the thing my first novel one of the things that i saw was how many bit characters i had and how the secondary characters so not the main characters but the sort of the the, the constellation cast around them just didn't have any character. They just, they had a few great lines and that was it. And I was like, okay, so I see this, 
I see there's a few main characters, this massive, massive cast of like cardboard people. This is something I can fix because now I can identify it. Mm-hmm. And that was something that I identified by going through and just literally creating quick articles with what I knew for each character. Um, it took a couple of hours for a massive first manuscript because I'm a big old overwriter. Um, but um, yeah, it was so valuable and I learned so much. The other thing I learned was that um, so many of my scenes took place in the same locations again and again. And that was something where I was like, come on, I'm a better world builder than that. I can I can do this better. So I started to, because I'd seen it in my, in my list, I could start to spread them out and be like, okay, well, what if this took place in this part of the castle? And what if this took place uh, over there and in the nearby settlement that I can see on my map? Um, that was really, really helpful in sort of spreading the novel out and not trying to, and, and basically spotting my mistakes. Mm. I think that was that was something that was really yeah. valuable. And so that was a workflow that worked really well. And building on them as well. Yeah. Like absolutely. I remember that we were looking at your map and we decided that your character should be taking a different path because it made more sense for them to go that way, for example. Yeah. That's great. Lexi says, 50,000 words of world building sounds like a comp. <laughs> I love your passion, but if you seriously, if you want to do that in December, we do 10,000 words of world building as a challenge we call World Ember. And it is a great chance to take your nano novel and turn it into a series Bible. So if you really want to do that, just come join us. We, we do challenges like this all the time. We're currently running Spooktober. We've got an amazing community. Um, just, just completely so kind and uplifting and supportive of each other and of us, of course, which is amazing. A uh, bunch of them in the chat. I see you guys. Thanks for being here. Um, so yeah, if you're seriously thinking, okay, I just want to sit down and write 10,000 words of world building. We have a challenge for that. It's in yeah. December. You can get the badge. Get the badge. I, I feel like usually the first like chapter of my novel is just world building. And sometimes I have to throw it all out, but it you know comes back. You know, there. I have been talking about one of our, some of our writers with that. And what they told me is that when they started writing a little bit of world being, a little bit of meta, their first chapters became less info dumpy because mm-hmm. the thing that when you start writing your novel, you want to give the information, right? you, need, you need to establish your world, you want to establish your setting. And that makes actually a kind of like grow into a massive info yeah. dump that nobody likes effectively. But by writing it down, they felt secure that these things are there. They will put them somewhere. Like they, they will pepper them in discussions, in conversations. Yeah, they'll use in them in imagery. exposition like they're supposed to, right? But they were there already. So they didn't yeah. feel they, they were lost words in the ether. They were actually in a place that was secure and they can go back to and start like pulling them out and putting them and where, seeding them where they should be. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's great. I, I definitely think part of it is like, if I don't write this down right now, I'm going to totally forget. How yeah, it absolutely. I think all of us have at some point woken up in the middle of the night. Oh, God, that's a great idea <laughs> to write it down. <laughs> uh-huh. um, so I, I have a question too, of just like, I, I, I love all this talking about world building and how it fits into your novel. And uh Sometimes I, I I feel like I come up with something and I'm like, oh, surely that's been done before. Or like, is this is this original enough to like build an entire world off of? And so I don't know if you have any advice for for like, you know, coming up with original ideas or, or how to how to feel about that. Yeah. So first of all, I would say, yes, your ideas are original enough. Of course they are, because you, each one of you listening is an original person and you will treat it in a different way without even trying to. If you sat down and tried to write The Lord of the Rings by heart, it would come out as a different book because you are a different writer. So that's the first thing I will say. You're fine. Do you. That's the best thing you can do. It's the last thing you want actually to like stress about if you're original or not, because that the only result can have is you not writing. Yeah, that's not what you want to do. (laughs) So um, there's two examples that I'd like to flag up, which are both worlds that I really like, just to be clear. The first is the world of the Dragon Prince, that Netflix series that came out recently, which I absolutely adored, can I just say? But I was really grumpy when we were first watching it. Um, so grumpy. I did not want to watch this thing. And Demetrius w- told me that we had to. So fine. Okay. I sat down. I was very grumpy about it. And I was like, oh, they've just got like stupid fire elves and stupid wood elves. And it's all so tropey and stupid. And oh, they've got stupid this and stupid that. And they've got a stupid fantasy king with a stupid fantasy. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's kind of cool. Oh, I really love how they've subverted that. Oh, that's actually, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's completely tropey, but they've taken that to a really new place. 
And I loved the world building of that show because that's exactly what they did. They took something that was a standard fantasy world and they did something really beautiful with it very subtly. It wasn't completely reimagined fantasy. It was quite Not classic at all. In fantasy. Fact, yeah, the world is very bog standard, yeah. but they have elevated in small details that made all the difference. Not to was... mention that I think specifically for this uh, project, the work they have done about talking about uh, LGBTQ, LGBTQ rights so smartly without oh, actually, you know, shouting out. It was clearly a focus yes. of their world building. It was something that right at the beginning, they were like, this is something that is super important to us. It is something that is built into the world. So we don't have to say, by the way, here's our token LGBTQ person. Um, they could just be, it was built into the world. It just, it was part of, yeah. of the and, world. And they were never here to shout about it. And that was the thing we're talking about. Actually, if you have good world building, you don't have to stress about your points because they will come out naturally. And that Absolutely. was the beautiful thing about it. But I think the real crux of this is that when a setting feels generic, it's usually because the details are not defined. Any setting, even a setting that is very imaginative, you can take two completely opposite things and throw them together. But if you haven't done the details of the little, the little detail work, and I don't mean every single detail, I'm not talking about painting on the, the the designs on every beetle's wing, right? But if you do the everyday details that make a difference to everyday people, that is the stuff that your characters will interact with and that your players will fall in love with. And that's what that makes is them the unique. stuff that will make your world feel unique, absolutely, yes. and not generic, because those details are specific, and it's that specificity that will make your world feel completely unique, even if you are just just writing another fantasy novel, which I don't think is even possible, by the way, because every novel, in my opinion, is, is unique like that. There are so many moving parts. Yeah. To create. Like, it would be very hard to write the same novel. I have to be yeah. like, honest with you. Like, we can make an experiment if you want to in our server. Yeah. You're more than welcome to give you a brief, a, a brief to write a thousand words. I can guarantee you all of you will write completely different novels. Absolutely. Um, the other example I promised you too is Robin Hobbs, Robin Hobbs Assassins series. Uh, really, really nice series of books. Um, I've read the first three. I haven't read further. Um, I know that there's another trilogy and another trilogy, and it, it just it gets bookshelf breaking at some point, which is awesome. But again, that is a world that is is in many ways a very generic fantasy world. There's two kinds of magic, but neither kind of magic is is so far out of trope that it's groundbreaking. But the way she tells the story and the way that she creates the world is very unique, and you leave with a really clear picture of what that world is like. And it doesn't feel like Tolkien and it doesn't feel like C.S. Lewis's world, right? It feels like something completely different. And honestly, that is, that's the trick. It's take your idea, double down on your idea and work out those small details because that's where readers fall in love with your world. It's sure. not the fact that every single tree is got a voice and sings. I, I'm just pulling things out off my sleeve. Um, it's the fact that, you know, it's those little details that your characters, um, interact with that's that's where the magic lies and the thing is that even the people who many many in many times you see saying oh my god you are like just copying Tolkien yeah Tolkien copied as well pretty much everything out of Tolkien is copied from somewhere else yeah C.S. Lewis largely from sagas uh yeah and C.S. Lewis oh my god it's like it's pretty much the bible it like refiltered pretty much so don't be afraid about that, that that's fine yeah yeah David R. in the chat says, I'm, I'll call it Lord of the Jewelry or A Game of Chairs. <laughs> well, do you know what? A lot of very popular books right now have started from fanfic. It's it's True. fine. Yeah. That's okay. Some that's very a, big blockbusters, a, in fact, started from fanfic right it's now. It's a viable place to start. You just yeah. remember that you will put your own spin on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being you is enough. You are enough. You are okay. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Um. I want to just remind people if you have questions to drop them in the chat. Um, but you guys have mentioned a couple of times about like ways to, to kind of subtly drop in world building rather than a big info dump. So I wondered if you had some like specific tips for, for ways to like pepper world building throughout your story. Yes, absolutely. So this is, um, this is a topic that is so close to my heart that I think I, I need to do a seminar just on this at some point. Um, because it's something that's so important. And when there's a problem, when people say, oh, I hate world building, it's because of this. It's because of expo dumps. People don't hate world building because world building is, is backstory. World building is amazing locations. World building is like 
beautiful stories that a, a mother tells their child, which later on turns out to be something really cool, but in the moment it's just this heart-rending uh, scene in a novel, right? That's world building. Nobody can hate world building. What people hate is expo dumps. And I get it, they are so 80s. And I think a lot of the reason that people suffer from this is because in the 80s, it really was normal to start a fantasy novel with a prologue that was the cosmology of your world, literally how the world came to be, which might not even be relevant to the story, but that's how books were written. Now it's not normal to do that. And so when people see Expo Dumps, they throw the book at the wall and that's the end. So uh, the big first question is, should it be there? So when we're talking about exposition, we're talking about delivering crucial information. This might be plot information. It might be something that expands a character, something that creates genre or like reinforces genre or creates a, a, a tone or a mood in your world. But essentially that's, that's the kind of information we're talking about, right? Conveying information. So the first question is, should it be there? If it's reinforcing your plot, it has to be there. It, it, you need it for the plot. If it's important for the mood of the scene, you need it. If it's important for a deeper understanding of the character, you need it. Otherwise, take a good look and see if you're just being an indulgent writer, because we've all been there, and it might just be an Elven Shoes moment. It might be something that is not relevant and your reader will not care about, but it's a really cool factoid and you can totally release it on your social media as, did you know that? Your super fans will love it, but people just reading the book, they don't need to know it at that moment. Yeah. The big key to exposition, and I cannot reinforce this enough, all of your world building should be in motion and emotional. Mm. One more time, in motion and emotional. You do like this phrase a lot. It's so important. I like it because it's easy to remember, right? It's got, it's got that subtle half rhyme in it. It's so important. So essentially, this is just show, don't tell. Right? So don't tell me that the, the moon is out. Show me the glint of the moon on broken glass, to paraphrase Chekhov. Um, so essentially we need to see the world building information in a way that the characters are engaging with or the, in a way that is causing emotion for your characters. This is so important. It's really gonna, um, it's really gonna make your readers wanna know more. And that's, that's what you want. You want to build the world building plot points into the plot. It should be plot points. If it's critical that, um, I'm trying to think of an example now. If it's critical that everybody knows that this creature explodes when under high pressure. Again, sorry, examples coming off the cuff. Uh, it's 9.40 here in the evening. That sounded like Psyduck from Pokemon. It does sound but... like Psyduck. <laughs> so if it's important to establish for the end of your novel and you want to foreshadow that this creature explodes when under high pressure, you better make it explode rather than just somebody saying Talk it explodes, it. talking yeah. about it. And you better do it in a way that is either in motion, it's pretty easy when something explodes, or emotional. The typical version that, uh, example that I use is uh, a table. There's a table in a room and for some reason you need somebody to notice it. Imagine it's a murder mystery, there's a clue on the table. Mm. The table should be in motion, that is to say flying at your face, levitating, you, it's your world, you decide. Or it should be emotional. There should be on the, something on the table, it's covered in blood. There's mm. a diary on the table that is the secret diary of the, the maid who disappeared. There should be something that draws you to the table that is emotional because otherwise it's just your character walks into a room and goes over to a table and there's no reason for them to do that and if you want to establish that this thing is important you need to make it in motion or emotional and that's why I keep using that phrase because uh it's it's the best way to make your readers care that's great advice I'm gonna... Very good. I don't have anything to add. Janet was very thorough. On it. <laughs> it's something I'm really passionate about. Um, in fact, if you want an amazing example of this, uh, the first book of the Mortal Engines, uh, not the movie, which in my opinion was massively sucky, but the book, the world building exposition is masterful. Mm. Absolutely masterful. Um, uh, it's it's just glorious. So if you want an example of really, really good world building exposition, that's what I would recommend. It's mm -hmm. it's seamless. And about three paragraphs later, you'll be like, oh, I think I think that was a, a little exposition drop. But you don't even notice it as you're reading. Mm -hmm. um, and it just it builds so beautifully. That's great. Um, we have a question in the chat. Oops. 
scroll past it, um, from Melanie Lankford says, do you have any suggestions about world building a dream world? Ooh, yeah, That's I love that. Um, establish your parameters. That's the first thing I would say. Yeah. So um, when we talk about magic, we always talk about cost, limitations, and what's the third one? Cost, limitations, and... Uh, repercussions. Repercussions, right. So establishing the laws of your dream world, what can be done, what does it cost, and what are the repercussions of that is going to be critical for like figuring out what can happen, right? Um, because- A good example of that is Sucker Punch. Mm, yeah, great example. Because in Sucker Punch, kind of you have to play with the kind of the dream world. And although in the dream world, they have still established essentially the cost of it, the emotional cost, all the limitations of what you can actually do. It's a dream, yes, of course. And of course, because it is a dream, sky is the limit but still if you go for sky is the limit then you don't your right your reader won't feel that you have any understanding of the situation or the parameters because anything goes right and exactly. anything goes not something you can actually cope with okay like even with dreams we talk about for example nightmares we talk about uh uh, uh when you um lucid dreaming lucid dreaming exactly or for example sleepwalking or there sleep paralysis are, or sleep paralysis actually there are specific themes you can play on and expand on, but still keep it consistent. Absolutely. I would say the other example of that is The Matrix, which is, again, literally a dream world. Um, it's very clear what is and isn't possible in The Matrix, um, even though there is a character who is, of course, the chosen one and can do extraordinary things. It's very clear that you can't just point at somebody and they disappear. Mm -hmm. And that's really important, because if they could do that, The Matrix would be two and a half minutes long. <laughs> right? There would be no plot, because you could just go, boom, disappear, Agent right. Smith. Boom, and that would be the end of the story. That is the problem when a world or a space or, or, or a magic system has no limitations because there can be no plot. At any point, you can deus ex machina and just blow the whole thing out of the water. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, whenever you're doing something extraordinary like that, whenever you're creating something that's magical or something that's, that's mystical, just in your own head, figuring out the parameters, even if you don't spell them out for everyone else, mm -hmm. is going to be so important. Figure out where your lines are. Even if you have a character that might bend those lines in the novel, that should be something extraordinary. That should not be something that everyone can, can do. See for reference, Neo in The Matrix. Christoph, I, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your name, by the way. Uh, in the chat, we talked about Inception. Inception mm, yeah. is a prime example of not necessarily a dream world, but definitely an alter, alternate reality world yeah. that had excellent world building yes. in the beginning because they needed to actually make sense. And because yeah. actually it is kind of this kind of a story that you need to understand it in order to make sense out of it yeah. and to continue in the story then you need to have the rules very well established because that's how you make the reader or the viewer, effectively, in the case of Inception, actually feel that they're part of the story and they have a chance of understanding what is going on. If you didn't have these rules exactly shaped, it would have just felt like anything goes, which is not something you interact with so yeah. well. As Don von Neumann says, you can only break the rules if you know the rules. <laughs> exactly. I think that's also a good example of, like, in, in Inception, there's somebody new coming on to the crew. So, you know, they have to tell her the rules. Um, yeah, exactly. So you get that um, audience surrogate, essentially, is the official term, right? Yeah. You get that person who needs to be introduced. And that's another exposition trick. In fact, that's yeah. why Harry Potter is a new, new to the, the wizard's world. It's so J.K. Rowling can sit down and be like, this is how the wizarding world works, Harry. But of course, she's talking to the reader, right? That, that's why that person well, is there. They went it's one step they... further because they literally went to school. But yes. right, exactly. <laughs> um, Another example of that is portal fantasy, where you see that a lot. Um, Narnia, we were talking about uh, C.S. Lewis as well. The children come into Narnia. They have to learn what the crap is going on. And by doing that, the audience knows what's going on. So, yeah. And actually, again, C.S. Lewis, I won't talk about C.S. Lewis, but Narnia... Well, that's something very amazing. The moment they enter the alternative world, yeah. they seek the queen, who is not only expo dumping, but is also an unreliable narrator yeah. because she has her own ideas and her own story and her own beliefs, and she wants them to. They she yeah. she wants them to know what. Yeah. She so is half first of them for. learn one story, and then one of them learn a completely, completely different, different story, story. <laughs> which is also super interesting. Like what a what an interesting way to treat that 
that audience surrogate to provide the audience with two sets of information. But also establish political strife in the world. Like yeah. they, he went straight on. You're like, here you are, that's yeah. the world. Here is the, the two sides. core conflict of this book. Mm-hmm. Go. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have some questions about magic systems in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay. Rather, rather on that. Um, so MSP writer asks, do you have any recommendations for increasing, increasing limitations? I struggle with this when trying to world build. And a root, I think, uh, asks where to research magic systems. Um, so. I would always refer people to Brandon Sanderson's Three Rules of Magic. Um, to paraphrase, because I can never remember these darn things, uh, <laughs> verbatim at least, um, the main character's ability to solve the core conflict with magic is directly proportional with how much the reader understands the magic and how much they understand the magic. So it's what we were talking about earlier. If you can just wave your hand at a problem and magic it away, there is no conflict and therefore there is no plot. And um, there's a reason that um, Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings doesn't just magic the ring into Mount Doom, right? There would be no plot. There's a reason that Gandalf uses his magic very sparingly. And it's because he wants, he wants the conflict to be there and the magic is not well understood. So the minute Gandalf solves a problem with magic, that's a deus ex machina and it's hard to come back from. And that's why they have added the limitation, which mm. was a beautiful idea from Tolkien for the time that was written, that the moment magic is cast, it kind of broadcasts and everybody knows where you are, or at yeah. least other magic users, because in essence, if you do any kind of magic, you paint a massive red target on yourself, which is quite dangerous if people can actually fly there and kill you. Which is yeah, quite yeah. So, it's the same thing that happens with the ring, right? Yes. When you put the ring on, Sauron knows exactly right. where you are. A perfect example of a magic item with great limitations. We actually... Um, and repercussions. <laughs> and repercussions, right. Yeah. Soul Gollum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we actually had a question in the chat from Eugenia about, um, do you have any suggestions regarding re- regarding world building artifacts, inventions and technology in general? Which I think feeds oh, really well. So many. So I would say, first of all, there is a template for technology and there is a template for items on World Anvil. So all of the major things that we have have world building templates. Now, the critical thing about that, there's a big space in the top where you can just free write, write whatever you want. That's absolutely fine. Format as it, as it as you want. There's also a little button that when you press it, all of these prompts come out. So it will ask you questions which are relevant to items. It will ask you questions like, what is it made of? How much does it weigh? What is the Who history of this it? item? Who made it? Um, is it related to a specific culture, for example? Is, does it have a purpose? Is it a tool? What's it used for? Um, there's also a, a, a similar template that is for technologies. And that can be straight up technology like like you would see in a sci-fi. It can also be magitech. It can also be magic spells can also be considered technologies Absolutely. in the right kind of setting. Yeah. So I would say in Patrick Rothfuss's world, for example, magic, magic is quite techy and a magic spell would be considered a technology because of the way magic is, is written. It's a very hard magic system. So that would be my first recommendation is literally go check out the templates because they are full of prompts and something will spark something and that was the reason we have them there because honestly yeah. most power users after a point they don't use the templates they go back to check the templates out and get some ideas when they're stuck because they do their own design and they want to do whatever they want with their articles which is perfectly fair like if you use a tool for a long time you know how to use it and you don't need the help anymore but finding out sometimes answering some questions will spark imagination will spark in fact better ways of doing things yeah. Absolutely. But I would also say um, whenever you're creating technologies and items, both of those things do not exist in a vacuum. So think about what this is an improvement of when you're talking about technology, because technology, although it obviously you get technology trees that divide, it's come from something. So what did it come from and what problem is it supposed to be solving? Because that's generally what technology does. Mm -hmm. And how is it solving it? And what are its limitations? Back in 2000. 16, mm. who wrote an article, I don't know if you still remember it. <gasps> yes. So we wrote an article called The Porcelain uh, the Porcelain Argument. Uh, Argument, which speculated that if magic exists in a world, it does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in a system that, in fact, uh, affects everything around it. And the good example we gave to give you, like, to, to understand how this works is this. In China, they were very lucky to discover porcelain. 
which was an amazing material. It could create amazing things. It helped them, in fact, carry things easier, yeah. store uh, it's inert, uh, food. So... It's inert, which actually does not uh, react with other things. It's actually very important for many things that you do, including, for example, the um, um, uh, salt and pepper as a technology, which actually Absolutely. means uh, we give us actually... Um, black powder. Black well. powder, exactly. Yeah. But at the same time... Well, yeah, well, I was going to say, but because they discovered porcelain... Um, that was something that did so many things and was so versatile. Uh, this is an argument from uh, from academics, by the way. Um, so this is this is something that has been written about. This is not something we just like pull off Wikipedia. Um, because they had porcelain, which was so incredibly versatile, they never developed glass. Hmm. Now glass leads you to telescopes. It leads you to lenses, and lenses extend the life of academics, which means that they can work and write functionally for a good twenty years more. Um, not to mention chemistry, because not to mention chemistry exactly. So a, a lot of chemistry um, developments came because of glass, because the fact that you could see through glass when you were doing experiments, or that does not actually react with anything else. So you can actually Absolutely. do chemical reactions in uh, in vitro, in fact, in Italy, Absolutely. in vitro. <laughs> so we put the same paradigm essentially to magic and technology. If you discover magic, porcelain. It does all sorts of amazing things, but it also, it becomes such a, a panacea, this cure-all, that sometimes people might stop researching other things that might be useful. And you can also say the same for technology versus technology as it was in that case. So looking at that interplay is a really interesting thing. So that's, that's the other thing to think about with technology. What exists already, what is being used, and what problems have not yet been solved that might pave the way for new technologies. Yeah, but also that means, for example, if you have a magical world, a lot of the things that you had in a world that does not have magic will not exist at all. Yeah. Like, for example, why would you discover fertilization if you can fertilize magically your things? Yeah. Which actually poses the question, what happens if magic disappears in a world that don't have fertilization? Will the agriculture completely collapse? Are we talking about actually like the instant farming, pour some water kind of thing, like situation? There are so many things you can think about how these things uh, work together. Another thing you can actually read a little bit about to understand how important these things is uh, resources on the Bronze Age collapse, mm. which is a very interesting system about systemic collapse and what does it mean to be so connected and interconnected in, in civilization. Yeah, absolutely. CB394 says, example of what I mean about technology, I am old enough to remember what life was like before the internet. Lies, <laughs> lies. There was never life before the internet. It's not true. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah right oh man this is this is so fascinating I, I love this um we're almost out of time here but it, it has oh. been such a wonderful and informative um time being able to to talk to you both and oh, hear your you wisdom so um so I would encourage people if you are interested in world anvil to check it out um again that link is in the video description um, and if you haven't yet announced your project on the NaNoWriMo website, you should also do that. Um, I would just add that if you're sitting in the chat and you've asked a question and it hasn't been answered because sadly we do have limited time, there is good news because Demetrius and I go live twice a week on Fridays and Saturdays at the same time that this uh, talk started. So that's 7 p.m. UK time, 11 a.m. Pacific time and 9 p.m. here in Greece. Yes, we're up late. <laughs> Or at least we're awake late, I would say yeah. that. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, please do come and join us. We love answering questions. You don't have to be on World Anvil to come ask us questions. Um, we just love helping people. We love talking about writing and world building. Obviously. Obviously, right. <laughs> um, we're just two super passionate nerds who made a, a tool to help people and also just want to help more people do creative things. That's on Twitch, so, by the way. So that's on Twitch. If you go to twitch.tv forward slash world anvil, you can find our channel. If you follow us there, it will notify you. It'll send you a little email when we go live. And um, yeah, then you can just like drop in and ask us questions. You are more than welcome. And we would love to try and help you if we can. Wonderful. Well, thank you guys so much. And thank you for having us. Honestly, it was such a nice thing to just hang out. It was great. This has been so fun. And it's so fun to talk writing with writers. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's what we do, right? <laughs> yeah. And thank you everybody so much for joining and watching and um, we will see you later.